This episode is brought to you by Undeniably Dairy. Dairy farmers are more than farmers. They're climate caretakers. They see water as a precious resource. Most farmers recycle water up to four times, from chilling the milk to irrigating the crops. And some even use technology to turn manure into renewable energy. To learn more about what dairy farmers are doing to make their farms more sustainable, visit usdairy.com. Maruchan superfans are everywhere. From the busy moms who want to deliver maximum flavor in a flash to dorm room diners who want to put some slurp in their step. There are a ton of copycats you could use, but if you want to bless your bowl, there's only one true Maruchan. Whether you choose instant lunch, ramen bowls, yakisoba, or restaurant quality gold, Maruchan is the only ramen worth obsessing over. Smiles for all, Maruchan. See what all the ramen hype is about at maruchan.com. Hey, you are listening to Oh Crap Parenting with me, your host, Jamie Gorlacki. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, hey, you guys. Welcome. Welcome. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about a couple of fall, autumn, autumnal things, (laughs) like staying healthy and sports. But first, I'm coming at you hot right off my Spartan race. And I wanted to tell you a little about it because you know, I love this race. It's my big race. And you know, last year I had all these like spiritual moments, you know, one of the great things about Spartan races, if you're new to this podcast and haven't heard that episode, people of all abilities do it. And it's really inspiring. It's really inspiring seeing people with two prosthetic legs, you know, or people who are carrying heavy things in honor of lost military friends or family members or carrying flags. It's very inspirational watching people press their own boundaries. And again, if you're new, I do these obstacle course races. I started them in 2018 and everyone has been a sort of spiritual thing in that I think in general, we've become just too soft as a society. There are very few obstacles. I mean, of course we have big obstacles like finances or, you know, mental health issues or various things that make society unfair. But in general, we go to the grocery store to get food. You know, we don't have to hunt food. We don't have to, we just become very, very soft. And I noticed this particularly in our youth. And so I have loved these obstacles because yes, they're manufactured, They're manufactured obstacles. I pay money to be challenged, (laughs) but they're so cool because the idea is you get over the obstacle anyway, by any means necessary. And sometimes that involves teamwork. Sometimes that involves using your body in a way that the obstacle wasn't designed for. And mentally, it puts you in a different place of like, I can do anything. Things are figure outable. You can go over, you can go around, you can go under, you can move the obstacle, you know, like metaphorically speaking, you can't move the obstacles on this on this race. But yeah, it, I think it mentally challenges you and the benefits are far reaching. And so it was so good to do it with Pascal too, because he's not a soft kid in general, but I just think all our kids are really soft. And I own that because my life was hard and I'm not going to make my kids' life hard on purpose, right? Like my life was hard by accident and I appreciate that and appreciate the person I became because of it. But our job as parents is to like make our kids' lives better than ours, right? And so oftentimes that means making them softer than we were. (laughs) So the details. So this was on Mount Killington, which is a double black diamond ski mountain in Vermont. It is the signature Spartan race. The owner, Joe DeSena, was one of his first like actual races. The Spartan race has a more military feel than say like a Tough Mudder or there's all kinds of mud races, obstacle course races. They're savage. There's quite a few branded ones, but Tough Mudder and Spartan are the the most well-known. It's basically like a big playground for kids. Like it's full-size monkey bars, you know, but the obstacles are generally built for men and tall men, six foot men, because the wingspan needed for a lot of these things as a shorty, shorty, ample assed woman, I have to make concessions, not concessions, but I have to find tricks, find tricks around some things. I ran my best time ever as six hours and 29 minutes. And that was a full hour and 10 minutes more than my last, my last race, my last time, or my fastest time, I should say. 
And it is 15 miles up and down this hill. This one was a world championship, which made it a little bit more challenging. Well, actually significantly more challenging. So typically you, and there's an obstacle called the death march, which is just like, I think it's a mile, just straight up the mountain, straight up a double black diamond slope. And it's just one foot in front of the other. It's usually single file. It's very taxing. Well, this race, there were at least four extra just straight up and then just to do an obstacle and turn around and go straight back down. Now, I know that sounds like a dur, it's a mountain, right? But typically when you're going uphill, there's like some meandering, you go through the woods or, you know, there's some flat, there's some this, there's places where you can kind of get a little break on your quads and your hamstrings. And this time there were just a brutal amount of just like literally straight up the mountain and then straight back down. So I was very happy I did knees over toes guy to rehab my knee because I probably was the only person not bitching about my knees on the mountains. But I can tell you this, I'm recording this three days after the race and my quads are still a little tender. I'm still going downstairs going, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> sitting on the toilet is a little challenging. <laughs> Pascal did amazing. He could have probably done the race in like four hours. His endurance uphill is crazy. Like he was running uphill and I was like, how can you even run uphill? But he stuck with me so we could take pictures and I will post pictures on Instagram. I took a lot of pictures of him and he did not take a lot of me, but it was his race really this time. He thoroughly enjoyed it. He was so proud of himself when he was done. One of the last obstacles was a sandbag carry. So you have to carry 40 pounds for women, 60 pounds for men. And it's a quarter of a mile up and down like treacherous terrain. And typically I never rest on the sandbag. Like it's it can be really hard. There's a sandbag carry and a bucket carry. And the problem with both is if you put the thing down, sometimes it's very challenging to pick it back up again. So they always recommend like you squat, you rest, but you don't actually put the thing down. And I had to go like 50 paces and then, you know, squat, 50 paces squat. And it was the first time ever doing a race that I felt like, can I even finish this obstacle? Which was a little jarring. <laughs> And I did, of course. And last year I had a clean race. This year I did not. I missed the spear throw, which was a little crushing because I haven't ever missed it. And they made it more challenging though. Usually it's a, a bale of hay or it's very rectangular. Sometimes it's foam, sometimes it's like pressed hay. But this year they put a board up with a circle. So it was more like a bullseye. So it was way more challenging. And the rule is as long as the spear sticks, it can hang. It just can't touch the ground. So that was more challenging. And then there were two obstacles that I, I gave it my all. And I just, they were pretty new to me. Actually, one was totally new. I'd never done it. It's called the ape hanger. And it's so you climb a rope to get up. And then it's like, think of a flimsy like rope ladder almost. You know, those ladders that have like wood rungs, but they're like almost wire on the side, but they're draped like a party crepe, right? Like two big drapes. And so you do them as monkey bars, but what happens is you go down and then you have to go up and the up is like really challenging. And I got stuck kind of midway. I lost my momentum and I got nervous about like, you can actually have full muscle failure, which is you just lose your grip and you don't even know what happened. But because my knee was fine the whole race, but because of the previous injury, I didn't want to fall suddenly without control. So I chose to just fall in a controlled manner. And then the other one was called this Olympus. And it's like a triangle board. If you can think of that, it's really big. It's long and it's got grips along the way. And they're like chains, they're little holes in the board and like rock climbing grips. And it's on a slant and they changed the material of it and they changed the grade of it. So it was super steep and it was super slippery. And typically I don't have any trouble with that obstacle at all. And I was shocked. I just, I couldn't even move like three steps. And I was like, shit. <laughs> and so I gave it a couple more tries, but this was in the middle of the race. And I was like, if we have a couple of more of those up and down hills, I'm going to be too gassed. So I, cho I chose not to blow my wad on that. <laughs> and then Pascal only missed uh, two obstacles. And so we had a blast. It was awesome. I did come in third for my age group in the open heat, which is, was my goal. Last year I placed eighth. And so I was really happy about that. And again, just doing this with Pascal made it. So I cried. I was so proud of him. He stared at his medal for hours. He was just like, this isn't a participation trophy, you know? And he was like, well, it is because we all participated, but you could tell it meant something to him as opposed to these trophies he got in baseball where everybody got one, no matter what, just for showing up. And you could really see the difference in his his whole demeanor. He was just so proud of himself. And we'll talk more about participation trophies when we talk about sports. <laughs>
All right. So that was our Spartan race. Oh, by the way, Pascal has the bug. He's like, okay, I'm going to run for time next year. And he wants to do a trifecta. So Spartan lumps these races. They have a sprint, which is 5K, three miles. Then they have a super, which I think is 10K, which is like eight miles. And then they have the beast, which is 21K, which is 15 miles. And so you can buy a package and run them all. And so he was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. So, so I created another obstacle course racing monster. <laughs> Alrighty, let's move on to staying healthy. Let's talk about fall, school, staying healthy as we approach cold and flu season, as we approach another variant of COVID and what you can do. Before I launch into that, because we're going to talk about some foods, somebody had asked me, what do you eat on the mountain? Do you, you know, stop and eat? And I think this ties directly into health. So while you're on the mountain. So when you do anything over four hours, it's considered endurance. And so you really should fuel your body. The body can take in 200 calories. I mean, like really use and utilize and assimilate 200 calories per hour. So you want to kind of stay on top of that. Typically what people do is they're not hungry before the race and then they'll go a few miles before they eat, or they'll go a couple of hours before they eat. And you can get behind on your caloric needs. I have tried many, many times, many races to eat well, eat the way I eat, which is like protein and fat forward. And when I hiked Mount Washington a few weeks ago, I gave into gummy bears, regular plain old shitty gummy bears, probably with seed oils. I gave into them and it was a little magical on a longer thing. The pure glucose of like Swedish fish or gummy bears, I was like, Oh, okay. That's a bit of a dial mover. So I gave into gummy bears this time. I mean, gummy worms. I like the worms, not bears. And Swedish fish, which I didn't know go stale. So just be warned, the stale ones are chewier and get stuck in teeth where they're not stale. They don't. <laughs> a lot of people use like goo packs. A lot of people use some sort of fuel that's like glucose along with electrolytes because you do lose a lot of electrolytes. This year too, I made Pascal and I turkey wraps with bacon, mayo, and cheese and lettuce. And I, I put them in foil so that they would be thin and light and they were easy to eat while we were running. And that was good because sometimes you get sugared out, you know, you're taking in so much glucose that your palate gets to be like, Ugh. so the bacon and turkey was really good. And I don't know if you're seeing this and you may not be able to tell, but I am inflamed like under my eyes. So sugar 100% inflames the body. I did eat like shit. I made tater tot nachos with like gross queso cheese. Oh my God, it was so good though. After the race, like you burn about 4,200 calories on their race. So that you need to like just eat whatever you can. So I made tot nachos and they were so good. And then the next day I was very, very hungry. So we went out to eat. So I didn't eat like shit. I had a really like, huge burger and we had a piece of cake afterwards. But then the next day I was like, okay, enough. <laughs> so sugar inflames the body. So when we start talking about that was my race fuel and an extraordinary circumstance, right? What we really want to talk about with sugar is it causes inflammation, which is no good for your immune system. So going into fall, and it's it's hard because of course we're going to hit freaking Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, right? Like New Year's, we have all these like sugar laden holidays coming up that just don't do us any favors. So of course, just right off the bat, that's one thing I would say is really be mindful of sugar intake, including like processed, you know, hyper palatable processed foods. One of the best things you can do. Okay. Let's start with, I guess let's talk about like from the big, big, big things down to the big stones first. Sleep, 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 and more sleep. This will get easier, of course, with the time change with, unless you're in Arizona or Hawaii, <laughs> which we keep hearing rumors that they're going to get rid of it, but they don't. I actually don't mind the time change. I know it's brutal when you have little kids, but I like the darkness in winter because I feel like it reminds us to hibernate. Like we really should, we should have seasons. We should have seasons with no activities. We should have seasons where we slow down. We should have seasons where we rest. And one of last podcasts, when I talked about my favorite things, I talked about my food inspiration is Tara from Slow Down Farmstead. And again, I can't recommend her enough. So they live off their farm. And, you know, right now it's harvest season. They don't even have time to breathe. She's freeze drying. She's canning. She's butchering animals. And she is gathering all her medicinal herbs, you know, foraging mushrooms. She's doing all this work in harvest time. And then once the winter months come, she lives in Canada, so she's going to get buried in snow. 
they rest, they sit in front of the fire and they read and they have hot drinks. And so I really love that seasonality that I think we have just gotten away from. And again, this will play into the sports conversation, but with sleep, I think in the winter months, we need to take better care. And I think part of that is slowing down and that time change to me just reminds us it's okay. It's okay to start slowing down at 4.30 in the afternoon. It's okay to get this this rest. But we really, really, especially if your kids are in daycare, school, it's a runaway train, the activities, the parties. And then again, we're going to get into Halloween parties. We're going to get into birthday parties. You know, it's always birthday parties, but these holiday events, and we just start shaving things off of sleep. I have been paying so much attention to my sleep you know, I'm a sleep whore anyway, but my sleep lately, I've been going to bed really early and sleeping a little later as the sun's coming up later. Maverick wakes up kind of at dawn because I trained him to. So, <laughs> so we're no longer doing 430. Now I'm sleeping till like 530, which is so nice to get that extra hour. I can't tell you like my body composition. Granted, I was training for this Spartan race, but my body composition subtly changed as did my mindset. I don't know. Everything just sort of cleared. Like I got very clear about boundaries. I think boundaries are just ongoing work, right? As parents, as, as women, as, you know, with our friends, with our personal relationship, with our businesses, with our careers, whatever, boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. And when you're tired, boundaries slip, right? You just forget about them. You get messy with your boundaries, whatever that may look like. We get messier with our boundaries with kids, right? Because we're exhausted. We can't do it. So it's just been so beautiful to have this like, really focusing on sleep, really focusing on sleep hygiene, you know, blue blocker glasses after the sun goes down, some red light in my house. And it's made a tremendous difference. And I was already paying attention to sleep. So for you and your kids, I can't say this enough, err on the side of too much sleep. Put your kids to bed earlier than you think you ever could. It will benefit them and it will benefit their health. So that's what we're really looking at. The next really big, I'd say the really big stone with health is vitamin D. And vitamin D, we know now in 2020, 2021, after meta-analysis were all done with COVID, the people who had the hardest time had the lowest vitamin D levels. And we are, we're all probably pretty chronically low unless you live in a state that is sunshiny all the time. Like I'm in the Northeast. The sun's already getting farther away. Like we're already not getting the same sort of sunlight. Vitamin D is best with sunlight. So in these months leading up to fall, get your kids outside as much as humanly possible. And I know at least here, it's starting to get a little, there's like a little breeze in the air. It's not cold yet, but if you can get them out with as little clothes as possible, playing outside in the sun in the morning, in the evening. We know this helps. We also know the sunrise and sunset is so good for your circadian health and that affects your sleep and it affects your mental health and it affects your immune system and all of that. So I would say get them out as much as possible. Sacrifice anything you can to, you know, I bring a picnic dinner with some turkey sandwiches, like and just make it easy, get some nutrition, but be outside as much as possible because you can get those vitamin D stores up and at a healthy level. It's really hard to get your vitamin D levels up by supplementation. So what you want to do is utilize the summer months, utilize the sunlight to boost those levels up. And then you really, then if you have to supplement during the winter, it's a little more effective. Remember that vitamin D is fat soluble. So you have, children should not be low fat. If your child's low fat, seriously do some research. Like children need fat for brain development. We all need fat for hormone production. Vitamin D is technically a hormone and it's produced by the kidneys and it helps you control the calcium in your blood, which is vital for bone development. So it's so important for kids. Like if they're outside doing big play, jumping, hopping, getting that vitamin D, like they'll build stronger bones. And of course, skin absorption is the best way to get it. So direct sunlight, direct sunlight in the eyes, direct sunlight on the skin. Again, while it's still, at least here in the Northeast, while it's still pretty nice during the day, I would try to get them out as much as possible with as little clothes as possible and as is socially acceptable. <laughs> the next best way to get vitamin D is fatty fish. All fatty fish are really good for 
the immune system because of the omega-3. So if you're not familiar with the omegas, there's omega-6 and omega-9 and omega-3s. We as a society, particularly in America, we're way too high on omega-6s and not enough omega-3. So those have to be in balance. And one of the big things that have omega-6 is nuts. And again, I experienced extreme, extremely great benefits giving up nuts. But if you are into nuts, remember that nuts in a shell, nuts have a protective mechanism, which is their shell. So we used to have nuts. I don't know if you've ever heard the term soup to nuts, but that means like a whole dinner, right? Soup to nuts. And after Thanksgiving, there were like little bowls of nuts that were put out, but you had to crack open, like crack open almonds. After you crack open five, you're all set because you're done cracking right? So that's their sort of protective mechanism. So by having shelled nuts available in the grocery store, we've done ourselves a huge disservice. Almond flour, all these things, you know, if you're eating almond flour, almond milk, and almonds, you're getting way too many omega-6s. And so I think that's like a detriment. So you want to counter that by lowering the omega-6s for sure, but upping the omega-3s and that's fatty fish. So that's tuna, salmon, sardines, mackerel. I think tuna and salmon are more kid-friendly. With everything I'm about to say with food, I want to preface it by saying the earlier you start your kids on these, the better. I know some of these foods would be really hard to introduce to a two or a three-year-old, you know, who are already kind of going through that picky eating stage. But it's really important if you have babies, if I could go back in time, the first food I would give Pascal would be raw salmon and raw liver. Like I absolutely, like I don't live in regret, but if I could go back, I do baby led weaning with bones and cartilage, like let him teeth on that. And I would do salmon and liver. And in fact, years ago, one of my like first round of people who bought Oh Crap Potty Training, I met a woman who her daughter ate raw liver, like kind of frozen and loved it. And she was like, if one person gets in my way about this. And so the earlier you start these kids on these foods, the less picky they'll be, but also you'll just get this like great nutrition in them early on for bone and brain and teeth and all of that stuff. So And I think same thing with like fermented foods for pre and probiotic, you know, kimchi, sauerkraut, the sooner you start them on this, and it may seem like, oh, sauerkraut's so strong for a baby, but they love like, "Mm, they love that sour. So the sooner you get them on, the more acclimated they'll be. Again, I realize it's probably really hard to feed a kid who's three, who's never had kimchi or sauerkraut. They'll probably be like, yo, but we know this because we know other cultures, the babies eat this food. So it really is palate development and it can be done. Oysters. Oysters are a near perfect food. And because their whole organism, they're super high in zinc. Zinc is better for immunity than vitamin C. So really focus on zinc. Zinc is hard to come by in food. I personally cannot eat zinc supplements. It leaves a a really strange taste in my mouth and it almost makes me nauseous. There's something about zinc supplements that I just can't handle. So I do oysters and it doesn't take much. You can actually just have a couple So I know like my Whole Foods has 12 for 12 on Fridays. You can get 12 oysters for $12, which is phenomenal. But, you know, I would look into that. If you don't live near the ocean, there might be a company you could find that can ship them. But oysters are for sure the best food. And even if you can, if you don't like them, there's many ways you can cook them. And you can also chop them up and put them in things. So if you're not, you know, the the texture is booger. It's like a booger. So... (laughs) So if you're not into them, I mean, I swallow them whole. I like the taste, but you can swallow it whole. That's how I do my raw liver too. I just swallow it whole. I don't enjoy the taste of liver. I don't enjoy the texture. So I don't cook up a bunch of liver. I just take it. I take about an ounce every other day as a multivitamin kind of thing. (laughs) But it's so worth it for the benefits. And what's really funny is, you know, they're tiny Like I said, I I don't know. I, I compare them to boogers, but I was doing, you know, I was training and I have a a food app tracker, you know, and I was just curious because I was like every Friday I ate a dozen oysters from Whole Foods and and I was like, oh, I wonder. I was shocked. Like Twelve oysters, which feels like nothing in your belly, is actually like seven hundred and fifty calories. It's crazy. I was like, oh my god, that's a lot of calories. I mean, I went on to eat more food, <laughs> but I just thought, wow. So you really could like live off oysters. But they're so high in zinc that any way you can get that into food, even if you have to mix it into sauces and things, which I'm not a huge fan of, generally speaking, but I think it's worth it for oysters. This episode is brought to you by Google Pixel, the official fan phone of the NBA and WNBA. The new Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro are built different. How? 
Take the Audio Magic Eraser tool that helps block out distracting crowd noise so your play by play commentary sounds crystal clear. The only phone engineered by Google brings out the audio you care about so your videos sound as crisp as they look. Learn more at googlestore.com forward slash pixel NBA. Audio Magic Eraser requires Google Photos app, may not work on all audio elements. So I started to talk about vitamin D and fatty fish, and then I went on to omega 3. So I'll go back to the vitamin D foods. So those fatty fishes again, right? So sardines. Sardines are actually pretty good. I have to tell you, I was not into canned fish, but sardines, I like them. Mackerel, salmon, tuna, those kinds of things. Fish, cod liver oil. So fish liver oil is really beneficial too. And this is where you might have an in with your kids. Rosita is a really good vetted brand. It's vetted by that woman, Tara of Slowdown Farmstead. She uses that brand. I use that brand and she does her research. So I will always take her I'll always take her bedded products. So that's Rosita. Cod liver oil is really excellent. And you also can get vitamin D from egg yolk and from cheese and from liver, beef liver. There are less amounts in those, but still really good. And again, with liver, with kids, if you haven't started them on that, it's very easy to chop it up into ground beef. So you can make meatballs, you know, you just use enough so that they don't detect flavor. It is a strong flavor. I'll give them that. And, and again, I don't enjoy it. So I just eat it. I just eat it raw and swallow it whole. All right, moving on. Bell peppers. Bell peppers have way more vitamin C than orange or orange juice. I do not ever recommend orange juice. I don't recommend juices at all. The glycemic index, the sugar spike is just not worth it. There's not anything in it that makes it worth what it does to insulin. And it has oftentimes more sugar than candy. So bell peppers have way more vitamin C than that. So you could do bell peppers. However, I don't eat bell peppers because they're a nightshade and it affects my arthritis. So if you do have some autoimmune stuff or arthritis, bell peppers aren't great, but you can take the skin off and the seeds out and that can super help. Greek yogurt is really good. So the probiotics in yogurt is awesome, but you want to go full fat, remember, so that your fat soluble vitamins get assimilated into the body. And then you also want full fat for kids for brain development, et cetera, et cetera. Low fat is not great for anybody. And then you could make it plain so that there's not sugar in it. And you can do some like low glycemic fruits like berries. That's kind of awesome. You can do like a little yogurt bar, which is a super treat. And you can call it Sundays where you have like um, some chopped nuts, maybe a few sprinkles. I don't think a few sprinkles are going to kill anybody. Maybe some blueberries and things like that. Thrive Market has a great ranch dressing. It's a dry packet mix and you can mix that with yogurt and get ranch. So if your kid is a ranch head or a dip head, that is an awesome thing to do without all the crap that's in like Hidden Valley. So that would be a really savory idea for Greek yogurt. Yogurt doesn't always have to be a sweet treat. So you could do some bell peppers with your Greek yogurt and get like a power, a double punch. (laughs) So all your fermented foods are going to be really good for immune health because they're really good for the microbiome. They keep your gut healthy. When your gut is healthy, the more time goes on and we're doing more and more research on nutrition, it's really about the gut, the gut, the gut, the gut, and keeping that healthy. And if you've been on any rounds of antibiotics, and you know some kids really have, they've been on big rounds of antibiotics because of ear infections, whatever, it's really important to get the microbiome all set. And so your fermented foods are going to be really good and yogurt. And again, make sure that it's, it's the plain yogurt, anything, even vanilla flavored is going to be really high in sugar. So you sort of negate. I don't think it's like, as I always say, I don't think it's like poison. I don't think it's like terrible, but if you're doing it every single day on top of all these other things, right? Like we want to keep our home really as healthy as we can so that when we do trick or treat, we have candy, right? Like I think the body can handle that toxic overload once in a while. I think it's just, we can't have it constantly flowing. Okay. So another couple of things you can do fermented garlic and honey is a really great staple to have around the house. So you take garlic peels and you cover them with honey, raw honey, manuka honey is great. If you can get manuka honey, the benefits of manuka honey are well documented. It is pricier. So Raw honey is a second best. The thing you want to avoid is honey from the market. Generally speaking, that is going to be doctored, even raw, blah, blah, blah. If you can get it somehow local, find your local beekeeper, that's ideal. But you leave that on the counter. You can Google fermented garlic honey. There's hundreds of sites about it. And that's a really nice cold remedy, health remedy, builds your immune system. Garlic and ginger are well known for helping immunity. 
The biggest thing though, however, is it's spicy. <laughs> it's spicy. And so that's probably hard to get into kids. The honey can be sweet enough that the kids don't notice. And then for adults, I do fire cider. You can make your own fire cider. If you have any local, I buy it from a local shop. It's very, very spicy, but it's preventative. It boosts the immune system. I think it's way too spicy for most kids. So I don't, I don't put it on there. Elderberry syrup is great. Again, I just went on a foraging hike and found elderberry, so I might make my own syrup. That's really good preventative. And also once you get a cold, it is contraindicative with autoimmune stuff and autoimmune medication. So be cautious of that. And I think that's it. On this note, guys, multivitamins for the most part are bullshit. So I see this all the time. Your kid's going through a picky eating phase and you're like, ah, I'll just get a multivitamin so my ass is covered. It's not really covered. Any multivitamin is not nearly enough of the things you might need. So it's just a waste of money. Do it if you want. I don't think there's necessarily any damage, but I think a lot of parents are being hoodwinked into thinking like, okay, you know, they're only eating chicken nuggets right now. Fine. I'll just do this and cover my ass and it's not covering your ass at all. So really stretch your palate and your kids' palates a little bit more to include some of these foods and you'll be better off. All right, let's get into sports because it's fall, school, et cetera, et cetera, if you're not already totally immersed in sports. I had a client who had a two and a half year old who was struggling with some potty training issues. And this child was in three sports, three at two and a half. That's crazy. (laughs) So sports has gone psychotic. Sports is like ridiculous right now. When I was in school, there were sports kids and then there were band kids and there were theater kids. Like not everybody did sports. And now it seems like everybody has to do a sport. And I see young parents and like, well, he has to do something. She has to be in something. Does she? I want you to question your why. First of all, I think we have to collectively jump off the merry-go-round. This is one of those things that like you end up doing something that's not good for your family because everybody else is doing it and you'll miss out. And I know there's a real actual thing. Pascal wanted to do soccer when he was nine years old and I was told he was too old to do anything but rec. Teams had already been decided. Tracks had already been determined. Like I'm talking about career tracks with seven and eight-year-olds playing soccer. That is insane because a kid has some talent at seven or eight means nothing when they get to college. But it's become this thing where like, if your kid's a little good at something, (gasps) okay, put them in classes, get coaching. Year round sports, year round sports are wearing kids out. And what we know is that many of these kids are burnt out by the time they get to high school or they have repetitive injury. Baseball, for example, which is said it's a game, it's not a sport, right? But baseball has repetitive injury problems, particularly if your kid is a, a pitcher, right? So when we take kids seven and eight and overwork them and overwork their bones and their ligaments and their tendons, they are so much more likely to get an injury at 15 than ever. And some of the greats, some of the greatest players of all time, I'm using baseball because that was Pascal's thing. They started when they were 12. They came from a third world country where they used sticks and cans. We've pressurized sports so much. And going back to that like seasonal living, When it's dark and your kid's playing baseball in December, that's not what baseball was ever meant to do. We were meant to do these sports seasonally. So a kid who was sporty would play baseball. Then in the fall would play soccer, maybe then play hockey. But all of these sports, now I got, I have friends who summer, they were like, oh, we can't go to the beach. He's got a hockey tournament. So in the middle of summer, they're going to an ice rink, which I was like, what is going on? So you're going to do what's best for your family, of course. But sports, if you have more than one child, sports goes into travel leagues. So once you get to a certain age, you start with travel leagues. And that's where that's where the money goes. It's a big business. And that's where if your child is going to be somebody in sports, they have to do it. And what I have seen repetitively time and time again, if you have more than one child, is this divides families because you're traveling different states. Kids are eating in the car. Kids are doing homework at 11 o'clock at night all because of this almighty sports. Now, when I coached my son's baseball team, we had a couple of kids who were doing multiple sports at the same time. We all know kids have a certain entitlement these days. One of the things is, is if you make your kid special and he goes to this practice late and he leaves early so he can get to the next practice late so he can leave that early, 
that child is going to be entitled. You are expecting your child, you are expecting everybody to bend to your child and it creates an entitlement. I don't think any kid should be in more than one sport at a time. I don't think any kid should be in any sport before the age of six unless they really want to. They have expressed an interest since they were little and they can't wait. So for example, Pascal at two years old could hit a ball reliably with a baseball bat, loved baseball, could watch it on TV, follow the rules. He went into T-ball, like excited that there was going to be a scoreboard and an ump. And I was like, oh, honey, that's not what T-ball is. (laughs) He was supposed to do two years of T-ball because of his birthday. And I had to take him out for one year because he was bossy. He just wanted every kid to play real baseball, like the Yankees and the Red Sox. And he was not fun. And so, you know, he had a passion. So he played baseball. If your kid doesn't want to go, hates being in the uniform, sits down, like you have to examine your why. Why do you want your kid in a sport? Is it just because everybody else is? Is it because you feel like the team, you know, I do really value team sports, team activities. I think every child needs to be part of some sort of team, but teams can be found There can be Lego robotics teams. There can be chess teams. There can be math teams. There can be theater. There can be band. There can be rock band. Like all these things are team activities that aren't sports. So really look and see. And just because you were sporty doesn't mean you can make your kids sporty. Yeah. And is it physical activity? Can that physical activity be achieved somewhere else? Can they play on the playground with their friends for an hour? Because that's more valuable than soccer at five years old. So people love soccer, but soccer is running. Yes, it tires your child out, but it's not big play. So you're not doing proprioceptive movement. You're not working the vestibular system. It's just, it's running, right? And at that age, they're not doing a whole lot of like bobbing, weaving, cutting around, right? It's just running, which again is great. It tires them out, but it's not big play. So if your kid's pushing, they're not getting arm energy, right? They're not doing twisting, tumbling, turning, those things that happen naturally on a playground or playing with their friends. So I really, 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 as we step into sports seasons, examine your why. And the bummer about most sports and most, you know, dance, gymnastics is you usually have to sign up for a season. So you pay and then parents get locked into, I paid money for this, you're finishing it. And I think There is value once you start something. I think there is value to not quitting. However, be cautious before you start. And so at this age, I would say under the age of six or seven, I would try to find places where your kid can do sort of one-off, where you're not committed. You can do a drop-in class. I know like my gym has like ninja classes, ninja parkour. Those are awesome. Skate parks, kids. Some kids like to start doing skateboarding. That's awesome. Do these one-off things so that you don't feel totally committed to the payment, right? That's part of the big problem is like, I paid money, you've got to finish this. So I just, again, these things happen quickly societally. I can't believe in one generation how sports has happened. And, you know, if your kid shows prodigy behavior, loves it, looks like they're going to have a a future, maybe college, maybe a scholarship, then great. But the chances are that your kid's not going to be a division one athlete. You know what I mean? Like those are few and far between. So I just find people like trying to make their kids into these granted for scholarship money, which of course college is so expensive, but also just trying to create a superstar. I don't love forcing that in academics. I don't love forcing that in athletics either. So just be cautious of that. Be cautious of sleep. You know, again, if your kid's playing these sports in the dead of winter, when it's dark and their melatonin should have been released and they should be in bed, are you edging family dinner back to eight o'clock? Are the kids eating in the car? Is that what you want for your family? Again, I coached enough kids. There was this one family. The whole family was Sporty Spice. The mom coached gymnastics at Brown University. The dad was a photographer, a sports photographer. The kids were Sporty Spice. They loved it. They loved the running around. I thought it looked insane. I thought these kids looked chronically tired. I thought they weren't necessarily getting better. I thought they could have excelled at one sport more. They were spread too thin. If it works for your family, fine. Ignore me. But I beg of you to just consider these things before you jump on that crazy merry-go-round because it's unending. And 
I put a stop. I was like, we're not doing travel league. If you're still interested in baseball when you're you know, 14 or 15, we can talk about it again, but I'm not doing that at 12 years old. I'm not. You want to look at your family and you have more power than you think. Create the family values that you want. Sit down with your partner, your spouse, and think, think about your life. And is this going to add value to your life? And why is it going to add value? Yes. And it can't just be, oh, because the kid might get a scholarship in 12 years. Like, don't make that. Like, think about your daily life. And I encourage this across the board. Live intentionally. Yeah. So many times we get caught on these merry-go-rounds or these treadmills because everybody else is doing it. The decimation of neighborhood kids playing outside together directly correlates to sports. And then what happens is if you even have a kid who's not sporty, right? You're like, well, I got to put them in something because there's no neighborhood kids. There's nobody to play with, right? So then we've all collectively gone along with paid activities that stress everybody out when (laughs) if we all stopped, it would be a different scene. And so again, for me, it's more about, I like to live intentionally and look at my life every you know, a few months and be like, are we headed in the right direction? Is this where I want to go? Are these the things that are going to put me where I want to be as a family? And granted, my family's small in a year. Or is this taking me away from the life that I would like to have? And so that's what I mean by intentional living and sports. I feel like just puts a freaking huge Thor's hammer on intentional living because you become, you become sort of a slave to other people's schedules. And so think carefully. That's all I'm saying. There's, I love more and more. We're going back to some rec teams and I love rec. If you can do rec, if you can get, that's like usually the town has a league and it's usually not, it's usually not the kids who are going to be in these travel leagues and stuff, but it's so much more relaxed. And so those are really good places in the summer. If your town has a town league rec department, you know, then your kid can taste these things without commitment. You can also just arrange a Sunday kickball game or a Sunday soccer game or a Sunday or whatever. After school, just the kids playing. That's also just really fun too. Because sometimes kids want to play soccer, but don't want the pressure of being in a league or competitive. Yeah, it doesn't always have to be this like competitive drive. When we look at, you know, the rates of depression and anxiety in kids and, and everybody blames it on social media, which I know has a fair amount of pull. But I also looking around in just my own community, seeing kids who are depressed, anxious, and have ulcers and looking at their schedule. And I'm like, is nobody looking at this schedule? Like, is nobody looking at the pressure that we're talking about eight-year-olds thinking about scholarships in college or even eighth graders like tied to something? I heard of this, a friend said her daughter was playing softball and her mom was like, you know, you you don't have to play this if you want. And she was like, no, but I, I have to get a scholarship to help pay for college in eighth grade. Like, that's insane. If you don't think that's contributing to anxiety and depression and um, ulcers. So anyway, live intentionally. Think about your whys. Think about why you're doing it. And does that why have to be met through sports? Can it be met through something else? Particularly if your child hates it. Like, don't make your kid do things they hate. I cannot stand this ethos that goes on. It's like, well, they have to to learn to do things they hate because they might have a job that they hate. Why would you start that shit at five years old? Why would you go with the supposition that your kid has to do a job they hate? Like, that's insanity to me to be like, my five-year-old has to suffer because I have a shitty job and I suffer. (laughs) If you have to get a shitty job and suffer, like, don't suffer beforehand. Suffer at the shitty job. Don't suffer at five because you might have to have that when you're 21. That's a craziness. All right, guys. Sorry, this is a lot longer than I intended, but I appreciate you as always. And thank you for listening. Rock on. Okay, bye everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. (laughs) You can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.